This is episode number 296 of the Inner Fight Podcast. Thanks to our show sponsor, Smith Street Paleo. Remember, rate and review the podcast over in iTunes. We will send you a goodie bag of Smith Street Paleo. This week, to join Andre and myself on the podcast, we have all the way from Georgia in the United States, the founder of Training Think Tank, Max Elhag. Let's jump right in. That's right. Welcome to the show all the way from the U.S. We're Training Think Tank. Max, thanks a lot for taking the time out to chat to us early on a Monday morning for you. Happy to be here. <laughs> Good stuff. Mate, for those that don't know, give us an introduction to Training Think Tank. What is it? What does it do? Where did it come from? Give us the sort of roundup of what's going on. Uh, yeah, so it's a coaching and education organization. We uh, opened up shop almost four years ago now. Uh, previously, I had been in CrossFit for like 10 years. Prior to that, more strength and conditioning-based stuff and working with you know NFL athletes and endurance athletes, body composition, right. and just uh, transitioned. I worked for OPEX uh, from 2011 to 2013, and right. my uh, demographic of trainees slowly started turning into more and more and more CrossFit. Um, I had left there in 2013 and just had the idea to, you know, get started and be doing my own thing and be at the helm of my own ship. So I had a bunch of really talented coaches that, or coaches that I, that I was coaching that, uh, decided to get behind me and we, uh, have five courses. So we have like a online exercise physiology assessment program designed for strength and energy system and a movement course. And then we have like 230 something athletes all over the world yeah. uh, who do primarily remote coaching. But we have, uh, you know, an in-person facility at CrossFit Passion, which is Travis Mayer's gym, who's like my longest term elite CrossFitter. Awesome. Uh, so we have 2,500 square feet there, and we have a pretty good training crew of awesome. regional level, games level people training there. Very cool. I saw you guys that, uh, recently started sorry, working uh, with Noah Olson as well, or I don't know if that's recent. Yeah, yeah, uh, probably about eight months ago. Uh, I started working with Noah after shortly after the games, probably about a month after the game. See, uh, I just I, I had known him because I competed in the Southeast Regional in 2011, um, and. Right after that, decided that I was going to be a full-time coach, and uh, so I knew Noah. That was like where his whole like I, I went up to Dave Castro and told him that he was going to make the game story came from that <laughs> regional. So I was aware of who he was, and obviously Travis has been in the same region as him for for years. So I reached out after the games, and I was just like, "Hey, buddy, keep your head up. I know you know yeah. this kind of shit sucks. It's part of sports." Uh, and just gave him like some little tips and then probably about a month and a half later he came up to uh to our facility we sat down for about a week and got a plan in place to put together some of the shit that was just broken in his in his body and his psyche and you know now he seems to be firing all cylinders <laughs> mate talk, talk us through your sort of your entrance into crossfit how did that come around and when did it come around yeah, so 2008, I was uh, training and doing MMA work with American Top Team down in Florida, uh, just like grappling, striking. I I wasn't really sure if I was going to – I was a collegiate – well, I wrestled in college for a year, and then my you know, injuries just kind of sh shut my career down, and I didn't know if I was – okay with my athletic career being over or not so i didn't know if i was going to try to become a professional fighter i was getting a lot of uh push to do that just because i was you know i had all the wrestling background i had won some naga tournaments and uh the guy who owned the gym introduced me to somebody at a crossfit facility in 2008 and right. i started just doing crossfit for my conditioning work and uh, I got kicked in the head in a sparring session and it like jarred my, my psyche. And I was like, all right, uh, I don't think I need to be, uh, getting kicked in the head for the rest <laughs> of my life. <laughs> and, uh, it was, he was like the, one of the uh, top 10 best fighters in the world at the time too. So it was wow. just like a fuck, this is a big mountain to climb. And I don't know if I want to be, uh, getting my head slammed in for this. So I started <laughs> training more and more and more CrossFit. Uh, I had a pretty extensive background in strength and conditioning because my father was in the Olympics for 
uh, judo and we had wow. been training since we were really young and I've always just been kind of obsessive with learning everything that I can about, you know, nutrition, biochem, hormones. Cool. Uh, and I slowly just started wanting to get competitive in the sport. Uh, we went to the games, that gym went to the games in 2010. Wow. And then I started uh, coaching people individually for the sport then. And wow. then in 2011, I went to regionals as an individual. Um, in, my, in my head back then, I thought, oh, if, you know, if you do well as an athlete, then you can get publicity as a coach and you can start to prove your methods. And yeah. um, a- after that year, just watching like the amount of time investment that the athletes were putting in, the skills that you needed to learn as an athlete were different than a coach. You know, like as a coach, I knew that I needed to understand, you know, emotions, people's psyches, how they train, why they made their training decisions, how to create training cultures. And I was like, well, I, I'm not going to have time to do that if I'm just focused on getting myself better. And I knew that at my size and my, you know, just natural physiology, it'd be a stretch to make it. I think at 18 in that regional, I probably could have, like, continued to improve. And I could do a lot of impressive things. But the guys that were crushing it, it was just obvious that they could breathe and so you put- had engines. And I was just like, all right, well. And right then I just decided full-time coaching. Right. So you put a lot of focus into the whole mental and the, the mind side of the whole thing, basically. Because you already had yeah. a lot of the physical stuff, but you you, you, you yeah. saw that the mind, the whole mind aspect of it was missing. Yeah. Well, I, so like on my company seal, I have Corpus Animus written there just because, uh, you know, I've always been, I took a mind and brain course in college and then just got obsessed with cognitive behavioral therapy, the psyche, sports psychology, and just was like, basically trying to figure out how to become a dominant athlete myself uh, back then. And uh, I just realized over time that there's just a, that the interplay between the mind and the body is really indistinguishable. We, we talk and we say like, oh, you got to do mental training, but all physical training uh, gets limited at some point by the psyche and all psychological training is specific to uh, whatever your discipline is. So yeah. you have to is be developing both aspects of that simultaneously. So I've always tried to explore that. I'm not sure if we'll ever get answers in our generation because it's like, how the fuck do you use your own mind to observe the mind uh, and try to run studies on it? It's like, uh, it's just, it's just an impossible problem. But we ask a lot of questions about it and try to get people on the right path yeah. uh, to fire themselves up. Aside from sort of you understanding that potentially you couldn't make it at the top level in CrossFit, what was it that was? You obviously have a massive interest from from like early on about the human body, but what really was it that motivated you to to coach people and to help people sort of get better at CrossFit? Was quite, I guess, unselfishly saying, "That's it for me. I've done what I can do. Now it's time for these guys." What? Yeah. Is that a tough decision, mate? Like, how does that come around? Uh, <laughs> I wish I could say that it was unselfish back then. Yeah. Uh, the reality is I just understood that I had uh, more cognitive and intellectual ability and a more ability to influence people than I would physical talent in this sport. Right. I mean, I, you know, like I'm, I'm probably three months into the sport with no Olympic lifting background. I snatched 130 or 286, whatever. Wow. I, what? I just said that in kilo. Yeah, kilos. Uh, We're good with kilos, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> we yeah. love kilos. And, uh, yeah. And that was in 2010 or oh 2011. God. And I was like, okay, well, obviously, like, I'm strong enough to compete in this sport. I could do, like, strict muscle-ups and strict handstand push-ups and all that stuff. I could crush anything that was under 90 seconds. But <laughs> when I had to start breathing for, like, five minutes, I was like, fuck, man. This is a, this is a pretty difficult thing to learn how to do properly. And, yeah. uh so I knew that I wasn't going to be elite just by observing the physiology profiles of the people that were succeeding. I could see how effortlessly they breathed for a long time. I could see that they weren't getting like local occlusion. Like they wouldn't like I could I could, you know, do Karen and then my quads would be seized up for like, you know, an hour afterwards. And then I watch other people do it and they're just like, you know, yeah, a little bit of burning, but I'm OK. And I was like, all right, obviously I can't fucking win at this. Or if I did, it would be a. You know, it'd be a stretch. Yeah. So back then I was just thinking, like, what's the best thing for my career, my, 
you know, I, I gave up a, a path in other industries to, to train people. And I thought that I was just better suited to do. now. I think the process of uh, investing myself into people has just become that I've almost, uh, it's almost become like my family. You know? yeah. I, it, it's all of my, everything that I do cognitively, all the reading that I do is to help other people. When I help other people. I get to live vicariously through them and learn, get to travel around the world. And I think uh, now it's just become more of a altruistic thing. But back then I was just, uh, young and hungry and just wanted yeah. to fucking take it to the world if i'm being <laughs> honest <laughs> very cool talk to us through uh about your journey with opex what was the biggest takeaways yeah. from that um yeah i think uh back then my scientific understanding was much more uh specific to endurance sports or strength training and uh When I moved out into to Phoenix, it was really just me, James, and then Leanne and uh, Natalie, who was an admin. And uh, we just did a lot of scientific study and inquiry about the sport, specifically like what was happening physio physiologically to people in the sport. And I think uh, it was just really interesting to do that. They obviously they had a pre-established organization, so they had resources to buy equipment do testing and uh it just kind of helped build my knowledge base within uh the discipline of crossfit and then getting another coach's perspective with what i'm doing we work pretty intimately every day just talk about ideas find ideas uh obvious any any two people who desire to lead an organization are always conflict. so that kind of helps evolve at least of all my knowledge base, I, I would assume, I don't, I haven't heard him speak about it, but I would assume that the challenges, uh, the constant question helped evolve his knowledge base and helped him think about the sport. So it was a good, uh, it was good to just start getting more, like more specific crossfitters. I was coaching that were, you know, reasonable level or games team, level. Yeah. but then I got there and started writing programs for people who qualified for games and I was all the uh, So I got this so much more raw data there. So it helped like speed up and accelerate the learning process. Uh, but I don't know if there's like one specific takeaway that I had no. from you, there. You, you said that you you guys sort of spent a lot of time on on more the geeky side, the scientific side, which yeah. I think if you look back, sort of I walked into CrossFit maybe 10 years ago, there wasn't really anyone doing that. So yeah. And, Even I think today, mate, I think a lot of it is quite hit and miss. Like people find something that works. They try it. It works for a little while. So talk to us a little bit about that scientific side. Like what did you find in CrossFit? What was what was interesting and, and, and sort of what are the solutions? Because I guess there are a lot of the common problems of, of, of the CrossFit community and of our listeners as well. Yeah. Uh, do you mean back then or do you mean now? No, I mean, kind of I mean back then when you first started looking at it at, at, at OPEX, really. I mean, that's when that's when you started this sort of more geeky approach by the sounds of things. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, a, you know, with regards to high level athlete development, there is uh, probably maybe more or an equal amount of training culture, training environment, mind state, discipline, dedication, like a bunch of non-tangible, non-physiology, uh, science-based things. Um, and when you put a bunch of really good people into that environment, you say, hey, get better at this shit. People are going to get better as a result of that competition. But in the process of doing that, you're going to break a lot of people. People are going to get fucking injured, like a lot of tendonitis on a regular basis. And uh, people then will also stunt in progress when they're all following this structure because adaptation is specific to the person. So mm. as we're going through, like we're trying to figure out well, what are the, what are the principles of adaptation that we can play? And then how do we blend that with the environment? And I think right now there's kind of a war between the two cultures. There's like the science people that are like, Oh, this is how it's done. This is how you assess people. This is how you move. And to athletes, that's just fucking boring. <laughs> uh, no one wants to hear about lactate physiology and heart rate and all that stuff. So I've learned over time, I think kind of since I've went there, my, my understanding of, of the, like of science, I, I put air quotes there just yeah. because, uh, 
know, I think different people like they read an entry level phys textbook or they get like a, a basic, you know, a, a, a understanding of VO2 max and then they think they're programming according to science from that. But it's kind of evolved from there. But I'm trying to learn a language to speak to my athletes that doesn't require understand exercise physiology and basically teaching them how to feel height and energy level um, movement quality positions creating those trying to blend science with the training environment but I think that is fucking necessary. Back then I think more necessary. I think that's where a lot of the CrossFit interest people comes from. Just people are slamming into their wall twenty four seven eating to be way too lean all the time, not doing enough low intensity work, not worrying about their respiratory mechanics, all that stuff all the time just leads to stagnation. Yeah, so I don't yeah. tell people, hey, you're fucking doing anything wrong. If you're progressing, you're probably doing things right. But if you're ignoring like best practices in science to understand from a science perspective, you just might gain some table or shortening your own career. Yeah. So I think it was it was obvious to me that I was like even back then that I would use my mind to try to get better at yeah. coaching and better at this. And, you know, science is just, a, you know, mental Avenue that you can do that. Obviously there's multiple different scientific disciplines. There's all, your own process of self inquiry. So I was never really like obsessed with the science or that I thought it was the magic formula. I just thought that it was a huge pillar that, that would help develop athletes. So it's really like one of the avenues uh, Interesting. So I think that's why I was on to go work with James the time and to under, or study on him uh, to help my process. Do you uh, do you think that in CrossFit in general with the programming stuff that we 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 tend to generalize a bit and and we don't look enough at how the individual athlete um, kind of evolves from different things? Do you think there's too much of generalizing? Yeah, I mean, I so my whole my my entire organization is all one on one coaching. So we have eight coaches and I think 230 athletes. So our coaches have anywhere from like, you know, 20 something, 22, I think, wow. athletes to 42 athletes. And wow. every program just gets written specifically for them. Now, in this sport, obviously, we do need comparative data. So as we start to prep for opens, we come up with comparative testers that are open specific and we give them, you know, two days a week to all athletes that are trying to do well in the open. And then we do the same thing for regionals. And then I'll have a training camp for my games athletes. But um, I've always thought that I've always thought people need their own, like their things to get themselves better. Now, yeah. the problem with that is that you're by your fucking self all the time, right? Like if you have a program that's specific just to you, then you have to figure out how to motivate yourself without an environment. You have to work out by yourself sometimes. You have to constantly be thinking about your sleep and your schedule and yeah. communicating with the coach on a regular basis. And I don't think most people want to do that. So, um, you know, trying to find that balance with people. And, you know, we do have athletes that we prescribe like four days a week for, and then they train with a group on one day a week, or we write their full program and then they take their program and they find training partners for the Metcons in there so they can right. get a competitive push. And that's kind of on the individual to dictate. I, most people say they want to get better, but when you tell them what's actually required to get as good as possible, yeah. they don't do it. Like, they're really <laughs> in it for something else. Like, Everyone wanna... wants to go to regionals, but nobody wants to put in the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, they, they say they want to make the games, but really if they had to put on, you know, two kilos of body weight and ha their six pack went away, they'd be like, nah, fuck this. I just want to look better. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so a lot of times people are just fucking lying to themselves yeah, and, yeah. uh, but I do think that we just generalize, you know, like it's a the human mind has a, has an insane capacity to reduce complex things to simplicity. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing if you're intelligent and um, if you have an understanding of all the fucking shit that you don't know. But when you're using it to justify your ignorance, it becomes a problem and you don't won't realize that it's a problem until you fuck yourself up. Like two years later, you're like, fuck, I really should have listened to that person. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, I think that's just a, a natural evolution of, 
of industries. It happens in fitness all the time. Yeah, like, bad, bad diets, bad nutrition, bad programs. They come in, they come out. Yeah. And I think the ones that last the test of time are people that are just operating with like good principles, honesty, balance between like the emotional side, physical development side. And uh, I do think that we'll probably get away from generalized fitness athletes and people will realize if they want to if they want to attain a high level of development, like any sport, they got to put in individually. Yeah. They want to have a, it, and enjoy the process and they want to like have fun with their friends and, and get better as much as they can with a cool lifestyle. Then it'll probably stay the way that it is. But in five years, I don't think those people will be games at or maybe 10 years, however long it takes to develop. Yeah. How do you see it for you? Obviously, Max, you obviously coach a, a quite a decent bunch, like your 200 plus athletes are pretty sounds like they're pretty decent athletes crossfit is mass participation so what should the attitude of what i'd call the general crossfitter be you know they work nine to five but it's now coming to the open and suddenly they're super excited but still can't do double unders very well like what should the attitude be yeah so well my organization honestly is probably like 60 percent people that are just general population right um Either they tried CrossFit, they loved it, they got hurt, they wanted to keep doing it, but they didn't know how because they kept trying to go in and get hurt, or yeah. they just want to look good, or, you know. And then the other 40% is either recreational or like competitive CrossFitters. I think for general population people, I have this, you know, model for health that I'm like, look, first and foremost, you got to take care of your fucking mental and emotional life. Like, you got to have people in your life that you care about, good friends, good people, good fucking loved ones. You got to enjoy whatever you're doing on a regular basis. Um, and then on that, like hormonal health, and that's that's harder to measure. Uh, you can go and get blood work if you have a good endocrinology yeah. thing on top of that on a regular basis. But little things like is your digestion good? Is your sex drive good? Is your energy levels good? Do you have a good, healthy appetite on a regular basis? After those two things are taken care of, then I, I start to think of fitness as, A, the ability to move, like create complex positions, not get joint impingement, not be in pain on a regular basis, have freedom of, of like body expression, and then kind of like strength endurance competition will be layered on top of that. So if, if that's the, the pyramid that would like dictate general fitness in my eyes. Yeah. I tell people like, hey, if you go into the open, just fucking enjoy the fact that you have something to compete in because we all get old, we all fucking break down, we all lose that at some point in our lives and then we have to live vicariously through either kids or, you know, friends or, you know, superstars on TV yeah. and CrossFit has created a pretty fucking cool platform where anybody can do it. So yeah. people are obsessed with winning and losing. I'm like, look, in the end of the day, if, even if you won the Open. I mean, I, Noah won the Open last year, yeah. uh, and I know him pretty intimately. It doesn't fucking change your net happiness. Like, <laughs> It's not like at the day after he won the Open, he's like, oh, my life is happy, and I don't need to do anything ever again. <laughs> it's just like, fuck, like you get new problems and new shit happens. So I try to tell people to enjoy the ride. I mean, yeah. it's going to have ups and downs, and you're going to fucking get pissed off if you're falling down the leaderboard. But I think... People who are just in it for fun um, or for the challenge of, of finding the best versions of themselves get too wrapped up into the comparisons. And right. I think the only people that should get caught into comparisons versus others are the people that are actually dedicating the time to be professional athletes. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just fucking lying to yourself. You're like, yeah. oh, I'm going to try to compete with you know this full-time athlete who's getting paid to train, and I have a fucking nine-to-five and you know kids to take care of and – so I think just framing it in that way where you're, you know, you're doing the competition as a rite of passage, as an experience, as a, as a way to push yourself is probably the, the best advice I could give to those people. Absolutely. How do you see the other end, mate, of, of those people that you just alluded to, the people that are somehow managed to fashion CrossFit into a livelihood and a professional sport? Because they're quite a, a minority, but yeah. how are they doing it and how do you see the future of that going? Oh, man. Well, I don't pretend to predict the future uh, <laughs> with regards to that because I, I, you know, I don't really know the direction. I think a lot of it is going to hinge on um, CrossFit's uh, management of the of the games right. and uh, yeah. the development of things like 
uh, the Dubai Fitness Challenge yeah. and Wadapalooza and whether that gets integrated into like a year long circuit or whether Nike, Under Armour, uh, Adidas and other big organizations come in and there's like free competition for visibility and yeah. um, that will help drive contract numbers up. And um, I do think CrossFit uh, viewers are a very material purchasing demographic Absolutely, uh, yeah. so they they buy a lot of gear so it would make sense for more companies to be able to get involved but mm. right now there's kind of a limit with regards to how many people can get visibility and it seems yeah. on the the male side of things it's just winning that does that right yeah. like froning ben smith uh matt frazier uh, are like the three m- biggest social media people and they don't really put that much time into their social media (laughs) versus other people. And it's just because they're fucking dominant and they won. And that's, uh, I think that's just how like the human psyche works from a, from a, from a male perspective. Like we, we look up to the dominance hierarchy in terms of like who's crushing things and who's dominant. And then on the female side, it seems like, you know, sexuality sells more than, (laughs) uh, more than performance in the sport, which is kind of turning the, uh, the monetizing side of the females into more of like a, you know, fitness modeling type stuff than like how, where did you finish in the games or how did you finish in the games? Um, I don't know if that will continue. I don't really know how the whole marketing industry works on a regular basis, but I think all of those things will need to change a little bit to push the sports monetary uh, success for athletes. Uh, I hope that it keeps happening. I think the growth of the sport internationally is growing. I think the growth of the sport in the U S is growing. It's on ESPN. More people talk about it on a regular basis. Um, even people that I grew up with that are like, have no idea what fitness is are like, Oh, you coach like professional CrossFitters. Oh, I saw that on ESPN and it's starting to like really become more instant. Um, so I hope that it keeps going, but I really have no fucking clue. Do you you think the way that CrossFit are, shall we say testing CrossFit at the moment is the right way. Like you say, you've got other competitions come up. What a is big Dubai fitness championship cash prize is huge and it tests fitness in, in different ways. What's your thoughts around sort of the way that fitness has been tested and, you know, and, and, and how it should be tested. Yeah. Well, um, I think, so if you go back to the original like literature that Glassman put out, and then what's being tested at the games, I do think there's a discrepancy between those two things. Like if you took like all the skills of fitness and all of that, and you tried to say like, okay, how do we create a testing body that uh, displays all of these qualities, all these energy systems, all these characteristics, it would look very different from the sport. But this is a sport, and it's uh, it would be so fucking boring if it, needs to it was like, yeah. Yeah, so there there has to be an aspect of, of making sure that the audience enjoys and wants to digest whatever the content is that's coming out. So I am definitely not an entertainer. Uh, right. I like I and I don't consume things. I don't consume media um, when I wa- do watch things like when I purchase things for content and information. I like if it was just somebody standing there like with a black screen and talking for six hours, I could sit there and pay attention and listen Um, but I know like in the development of my own courses, people are like, Hey, you should put like infographics in there and all this stuff to like, keep it exciting and keep the mind engaged. And I was like, fuck, I guess I didn't realize that my brain worked differently. But because (laughs) of that, I think I'm probably more effective as a coach because I can objectively analyze like, Hey, this is what you need to get better at the sport. These are the principles that govern the tests that have come out. These are the things we need to do with your physiology to make you more successful. This is how we're going to keep you healthy long-term. This is how you have to eat to support things. Um, But as an entertainer, I'd be fucking awful. Like my, (laughs) my tests would all be fucking boring. Uh, There would be like no fucking music playing so I could hear people breathe. Uh, So I think they're doing a much better job than I could even pretend to, to say that I would do well because it's fucking growing and people love watching it. Like yeah. I always joke around. I'm like, if I went into fucking LA fitness and I grabbed five of my friends and I was like, look, these people are going to race up on the fucking elliptical and the stair stepper. They'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? But somehow <laughs> we made working out a, a cool sport to watch. Yeah, so yeah. I can't fucking comment on whether or not the testing body is good. 
because people are watching it. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is most important, which has helped build my career. So yeah, exactly. um, I wouldn't ever put any criticism on that. Um, but I would say that there's definitely a discrepancy between what's actually like the actual definition of fitness that CrossFit put out versus the testing architecture that comes out. Yeah. I think there's a discrepancy there. But I'm like that this is the sport. We're not talking about the definition. We're talking about what comes out in the test. So Absolutely. I don't I don't really waste my time worrying about it. It would just stress me out. <laughs> This is, a, this is a more specific programming thing. Uh, what's your thoughts on periodization, like the segmentation of training blocks over a certain amount of time? Like, do you have your athletes peaking for a certain amount of times? Like, will they have strength periods, like conditioning, more yeah. dominant periods? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I've been heavily influenced. Not I, not that I would have any of them as my dogma, but, like, by Isurin's block periodization models, by Berkachansky's text, by uh, Tudor Bampa's periodization book. So I think that it's really important to figure out what things that you can put together in a training cycle to uh, get that's that's going to get people's net fitness up at the highest level and peaked at the right time all year. I think people are making a mistake that they're trying to measure their fitness 24-7, 365. They have yeah. no downtime, no time to decondition, no time yeah. to overfeed and put some body fat on and help their hormones restore back to baselines. Everyone says things like, oh, there's no off seasons, which I think is bullshit because, yeah. you know, Travis has been a three times games athlete who's continued to get better year after year, uh, who took 10th this year, who probably takes more downtime than anybody else that I program. Um <laughs> And by necessity, too, like if he keeps pushing, the intensity of his sessions is getting higher and higher and higher as a result of his fitness climb. And if you keep maintain the same level of aggregate volume year round and the intensity is rising, you're just going to fuck people up eventually. So yeah. I think it's important. But right now, the old periodization models, the very linear ones don't really apply to CrossFit. So we've been trying to come up with our own models uh, to to figure out how do we get yearly adaptation in all systems but change the distribution of training time to each one of the categories at the appropriate time so like as an example in the off season just raw strength like not strength capacity is tested by like 30 cleans for time at 120 kilos but just like a 1rm clean or a 1rm front squat that would kind of be worked more on the off season movement quality would be more worked on in the off season Uh, more lower intensity, like energy systems yeah. uh, training that's going to help with cardiac output and, and volume tolerance is going to be more in the off season. And then as we start to peak for competitions, it becomes more sports specific. So we're always working within periodization models, but we're kind of using our own because uh, there's not enough study and research in this sport to have good models. So I've yeah. just been creating models year after year after year after year and refining things, throwing away that doesn't work, taking what does work and figuring out how to get people peaked at the right time. So I think it is important, but I don't have like a, this is how you do no, it no. type. Yeah. Response. Is it, is it, you starting to see sort of trends and patterns because CrossFit, it, it's a young sport and obviously you're pioneering a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of what's going on here, mate. Are you starting to see some pretty solid patterns emerge that you can say, definitely don't do this, damn right do this, and this bit in the middle, we're still trying to figure it out? Okay, I could probably give you some rules for people that aren't, like, really fucking gifted and elite. Yeah. But honestly, the, the thing that I've been most the thing that I've been most swayed with in terms of, like, I've had to change my mind on this is – What, like, somebody like Travis or Noah can do, it really fucking defies, like, the laws of adaptation. Right. They can get better at everything almost instantaneously. So, right. one of, like, even as a little example, one of the things that I've been trying to do for my athletes is, is go through a quest of improving movement quality on, like, a really, really high level. And I, you know, said, I know as an athlete right now with the amount of time I can to train, I'm not going to be able to do some of the shit that I could do in the past conditioning-wise. But mm -hmm. I still should be able to snatch close to 140 kilos. I still should be able to do handstand walkings. I want to be able to do a back bridge. I can do a back lever. I want to be able to do a front lever. I want to be able to do things that – I can show an athlete like, hey, this is the position your body needs to be in to create the shape. Mm. And 
I spent like three or four months trying to create this position that I was trying to create in Travis and trying to explain to him with anatomy. And when I finally got it, I was like, hey, I need your body to do this. Within a week, in the middle of a fucking strength training cycle, with in the middle of preparing for Dubai, he was able to create the position in a week that took me fucking three months to fuck around with. So <laughs> these guys are just really, really, really fucking adaptive to everything. So yeah. they can do high volume lactic sprint intervals and like super long chippers with 175,000 thruster contractions and still get their snatches up. Yeah. But most regular people don't up, don't adapt like that. So I think even just the the general rules if you're trying to improve like short 3 to 7 minute maximal effort metcons you probably can, you know, pair your strength adaptations with that at the same time but if you're trying to improve like the 25 30 minute time domain and you have a long training history trying to slam like a really really aggressive strength training cycle that is more of a sympathetic nervous system driver that makes you more powerful and trying to get better at doing like a thousand reps for time or you know be able to do 10ks 5ks really successfully uh it's just not going to work that well so for untrained athletes, anything fucking works because they get better to everything. But as we start to get these like people with five year training histories that are competing, you know, and they're getting like 100th to 150th in their region in the open, when they're following programs that are like games athletes programs, it's holding them back. They need more periodization for them. They need to stop sending conflicting signals to their body and try to time their peaks better. Uh, the elite are different. They're just fucking freaks. Right. Um, but. You know, I don't know. But if it's working for you, don't change it. <laughs> Mate, you spoke a lot early on about environment. How do you try to create the right environment? And what is the right environment for training and for to, to develop sort of rounded and, and better athletes? Um, I, I don't know if I could say that it's the right one. It's the one that I'm trying to create. Um, I don't think anybody can say that they have the right training environment yet because you need to figure out what produces longevity in the sport. So if somebody's like, you know, oh, well, people are going and training with Froning at Cookville and they won the games three times or or he won the games four times and then they won as a team twice so they have the right training environment, then we have to say like, okay, well, we have to see what that training environment next 15 years does to produce athletes, to take them from the ground level, Mm -hmm. build them up to the top, uh, keep them healthy for long periods of time, see what they look like after their athletic careers. For me, the thing that I want my athletes to have is the ability to reach their absolute potential, longevity, and a life after sport. And I saw that Um, you know, coaching NFL athletes, what they looked like after their careers was like fucked up. And I was just like, I don't want athletes in this sport if I'm coaching them to look back at their athletic careers and regret how much fucking damage they did to their bodies in pursuit of some goal that's not going to mean anything to them in the future. Right now it's important to them, but in the future, other shit's going to be more important to them. So I want to create an environment where where people are willing to ask a lot of questions and self-reflect to constantly ask themselves, like, is this real still important to me? Like, or when you get to a turning point where you're like, fuck, my, my knees are really sore, but I'm three weeks out from regionals. I got to fucking squat a lot on sore knees. Is this, do I want to make that decision versus I have to make that decision. So I want to create a a mindful environment first, which I think I've, I've done. There's a lot of scientists and, really smart dudes that uh, work at my facility. And then there needs to be a fucking fierce, a fierce competitiveness all the time. Like anytime I write something on the board, there's got to be people there that want to fucking win. If that doesn't happen, if you don't have that, then I don't think you're ever going to drive like the overall group up because uh, that competitiveness, that emotional like why that people have to win and avoid loss is an important aspect of yeah. development. So yeah, right. I try to ensure that there's enough competitions, even in little shit, like going out and fucking playing paintball and going bowling and actually having people constantly fucking try to win it uh, so that it carries over into the gym 24 um, seven. And then the aspect of just like play and fun. I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm sure even in this short period of conversation, you can tell them 
a pretty serious dude. Yeah. Uh, I fuck around and talk a lot of shit in my gym, but um, I don't think people realize when I'm fucking around and when I'm being serious. <laughs> uh, I am trying to make sure that my athletes understand that they like they should have fucking fun. They should just like after a hard training session on Saturday, fucking play spike ball or like do things intelligently so they don't fucking hurt themselves and ruin their careers. But yeah. um, there's got to be an aspect of just play, fun, enjoyment of life. And I think if you have those three things built into a training culture, um, you really can't go wrong. Even if you're not producing champions, if people got to spend five years of their life improving their minds, improving their bodies in a sport and getting better at something and having fun, like – that's a good fucking life, yeah, at least in my eyes. So yeah. I don't know if it's correct, but it's what we're what I'm trying to build. That's very cool. I have another a little more um, programming specific question, which involves deloading, like taking time off, like lower volume, lower intensity. I've looked a lot yeah. into like the Chinese weightlifters and American gymnasts, like the gym that, that deloads every fourth week and all, all yeah. those kind of things. What's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think the frequency just gets determined by the athlete. So like if somebody has a really powerful physiology and they de adapt from aerobic training and muscle endurance really quickly, I have to, I have to deload them more frequently, but their deloads still have to be a lot of movement. So they'll might do like, you know, three weeks of hard training or two weeks of hard training. And then the third week, they'll still do the same number of training hours but the intensity of the structure will change. So as an example, like a Metcon would turn into a low intensity EMOM where the contraction volume is like 60 to 70% of what was done in the actual workout. They, the swim intervals they did where they accumulated 2000 meters of swimming will drop to like, you know, a thousand meters of low intensity with some stroke play and some underwaters and some kicking drills. Um, their gymnastics, that's muscle ups, chest to bars, handstand walking in a Metcon will turn into like, low intensity isometrics so they'll deload more frequently but their deloads will be uh less aggressive the okay. people who are uh and what's more frequently more, like it, it depends it could be as fat like i've had people that will train hard for 10 days and deload for four days every every two weeks and then i have some people that'll be like you know three weeks of training one week of off training it just it depends on the athlete it depends on their schedule it depends on some people just go fucking crazy when you drop their volume because they have these irrational fears that if they take a day off they're going to get fat and lose all their fitness <laughs> uh, so you can't just take them and say hey that's stupid and this is smart so we're going to go from here to here because they'll fucking hate it so as a coach i'm like okay well you're here and i want to get you here over the course of the next year but let's start with this like you know one percent change or one little change and slowly you know change your program structure so that you're at optimal over the course of a year and that's the You know, that's kind of the coaching process. People ask me programming questions all the time, but those programming things get um, – they get developed retroactively after you're coaching someone. And then when you see enough patterns, you're like, oh, powerful people can – can they can deload more frequently, but the deload can't be as aggressive. But it's, it's like a big spectrum. There's no, like, concrete number that no, says okay. – How do you deal with that, uh, that, that mindset, mate, of, yeah, if I take one day off, I'm going to lose all my fitness? Because I think that's, that, that's a problem that I see not only in, in high-level athletes, it's in entry-level. Like People just want to do more and do more and do more. So as a coach, what's your message to people to, to sort of relax a little bit? Well, I, so I, just, I always use data to do that right? because I'm like, well, your feelings are never rational. Like every time somebody's like, oh, I feel like I'm losing fitness. Yeah. It's never right. It's not like you actually are. You're just fucking like living in your feelings. Yeah. So I've always used, you know, Travis as an example because he was my best athlete. Now yeah. it's kind of Travis and Noah. Um, and Noah came on board and he had that same type of mindset. I said, look, if you want to change coaching philosophies and you want to do things differently, then you have to trust what I'm saying. And if it doesn't work, then you can fucking fire me. Like I don't, I'm not going to tell you to stay with me if I don't produce. So yeah. I'm saying this is what you should do. Try it and see what happens with regards to your body on lower training frequency. He's improved metrics on, you know, long duration running one RM cleans ability to cycle two uh, or a hundred, a hundred and 
10 kilo snatches for 20 reps. Oh. Um, and when you're improving like a broad base of fitness tests on less volume, I'm like, well, I call that fucking intelligent. <laughs> if you need a hundred hours of training to get the same adaptation that you can get in 20, yeah. then you have 80 hours of just wasted fucking stress on your body. Yeah, right. So now that I have like concrete data with people and have taken people that are at an elite level, then shown them that different methods might work and driven their fitness up. It's like, well, every time you think in your head, hey, I need more volume because I'm not getting better, you can just fall back on the fact that, hey, last time I thought that, I was wrong because I lowered my training frequency and got better with data. And mm. a lot of people in CrossFit, they constantly want to vary everything that they never know if they're getting better. <laughs> and they don't know how to analyze the sport. Yeah. Right? Like they measure their fitness from their 1RM snatch. And I'm yeah. like, well, how is that, you know, a broad and inclusive test of strength in this sport when it's yeah. te strength is tested in so many different ways. So yeah. they don't have like a, a testing body that they can refer back to that dictates improving for the next year's competition. Very interesting, mate. I think we could, we could go on all day. We won't, we, we really value your time before we do wrap things up though. Yeah, male and female winners of the 2017 CrossFit games. Who will they be? Can anyone <laughs> beat Matt Fraser? <laughs> well, you can't put me on the spot like that because I have, I have uh, too many male. I have too many male horses in the race that if I pick <laughs> one of them, they'd fucking hate me forever. Females? Um, can you call out a female then? We won't put you on the spot of the uh, males. Can you call out man, a female? Who'll be up there on the I, top three I, for honestly, the females? Honestly, I just I don't want to try to predict the future because people will look back at this and be like, <laughs> "Oh, Max is an asshole." He, he thought he knew. I think there's I think there's like five five females that seem to have separated themselves yeah. in terms of their capacity, their fitness, um, and their ability to actually compete and perform on game day. Yeah. I, I think whether which one of those five is going to win is probably dictated based on what the tests are, what people's training cycles look like, how they prepared, how they peak. So, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd say that, that that's pretty obvious on that side. Like the people that are in the top on the female side seem Absolutely. to be the same yeah. uh, year after year after year. Um, on the male side, man, I don't know. Frazier was really, really, really good last year. Yeah. Um, I do know just based on hearing his interviews, I don't know him personally. He did a lot of running, a lot of sprint training, a lot of distance running. And, uh, he's obviously got a really strong background in weightlifting and just good at like traditional CrossFit. So because 33% yeah. of the testing body was running this year in yeah. some form, yeah. I, that might have skewed his dominance this year. Yeah. If they don't choose to do that this year, maybe it'll be you know more of a competitive thing. But I don't think anybody is is bulletproof. I think everybody yeah. can get beat. So cool. um, I instead of predicting, I usually am just fucking excited to watch it. And I <laughs> as a coach, I'm competitive, and I want whoever I'm working with to fucking win. Um, well, mate, maybe so, we'll uh, we'll watch how those athletes that you're working with go, and maybe we'll catch up after after the CrossFit Games, and you can tell us a bit more about it. But this has been an absolute awesome 45 minutes or so, mate. I think it's super valuable for us, for our listeners, and 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 hopefully gets you guys at Training Think Tank. I, I think you deserve a lot of respect for what you guys are doing so congratulations and really all the best for the season and keep putting Thanks, out man. as much content as you, as you do like yeah. I, I love reading the articles and it's very cool so much good stuff out there Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys, for having me. I uh, always appreciate that people want to listen to me blab my mouth. <laughs> Not at all, mate. We appreciate it. We appreciate your insights, and hopefully we can catch up later in the year after the games. Cool. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers now. Thanks a lot for tuning in to this episode of the podcast, folks, and a massive shout-out to Max. That's some awesome, awesome, thought-provoking content he shared with us there. Hopefully you'll hop over and check out his site, Training Think Tank, and get some more of his ideas. Obviously a very experienced and passionate guy. Please rate and review the podcast. This mystery paleo will send you out a load of goodies. Until next time, take care.